Well, we've been married for 40 years. We met in Albuquerque. I was still a senior in high school. He was going to college there in I Albuquerque. Just, I just graduated the year before. And uh, actually four months later, we were married. <laughs> I graduated from high school into marriage. And um, we lived there in, in Albuquerque for about five years and then decided that his career, which was in welding at that time, um, was more available in, uh, in Kansas. And so we moved to Kansas and we spent 12 years in Kansas and then we moved back here in 85. And after we got the diagnosis, I started looking up this disease. And I was actually really surprised what this disease can do to someone. Well, I came to Hatch to be with my parents. Uh, they were pretty fragile and did not want to go up to Wyoming. And, uh, but I do miss it. I had a job there that, that uh, with the Casper Star Tribune, uh, the Letters Forum, and um, Music and Poetry Series where we went around the state. and Lots of fun, lots of music, lots of poetry, lots of fun. Um, I remember when my mother said, you know, this is going to be like camping, but uh, I really like Hatch, and um, I enjoyed working in my dad's garden, and he broke his hip in 2006, and that changed everything. He became bedridden, um, then mama became wheelchair bound. So that meant 24-7 care. Um, <clears throat> it was working all right until I became sick in October. And uh, I, would <laughs> I would try to get up in the morning and <clears throat> it would take me forever to get dressed. I'm a college professor and very fortunate that um, with this disease I can teach from home because I'm an online teacher. And it's kind of the light of my life right now, other than my grandson, because um, I teach teachers at the graduate level and I get to learn all about their subjects all the time. So um, it came in really handy recently that I was teaching because I had another bout of pneumonia. So I was in bed and I was teaching from bed. And I can do that, I've done it many times. So my students don't even need to know that I'm having a rough time. But uh, it's been a pretty debilitating disease. borderlands of the great American Southwest. Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and northern Mexico itself. A land rich in history, tradition, agriculture, cattle, dairy, tourism, and an insidious disease which many in the medical profession and general public know little or nothing about. A disease which lies dormant waiting to infect humans and animals without discrimination. This disease called valley fever, its medical name is coccidioidomycosis, or, or coxy for short, uh, desert rheumatism, there's a variety of other names. Coccidioidomycosis is caused by coccidioides immatus. It's a uh, fungus that lives in only certain parts of the world, and we actually live in one of those, the, the southwest deserts of um, Southern California, Central California, Arizona, New Mexico, and into Texas are the areas where the fungus likes to live. 
Its, its location is primarily in the soil. It only occurs in certain parts, um, which is a puzzle to ecologists as to where it lives and where it doesn't. But in, in broad terms, it's a southwestern uh, disease. It, it causes um, infections in many mammals, including us. Dogs actually are very susceptible to this. Also, uh, llamas. You get an infection if the spores that develop in the, in the dirt uh, get disrupted and get into the air uh, over uh, a breezy day or, or if people disrupt soil. And, um, and these spores then uh, stay, they're small enough to stay in the air for oh, perhaps indefinitely, for long periods of time, certainly. And uh, if you happen to inhale one of these spores, uh, it goes deep into your airway, down into your lungs, and as a result can start an infection. Once a fungus spore is inhaled into the lungs, the round cell develops into a spherule by repeated internal division. This happens within 48 to 72 hours after the spore has been inhaled. If and when a spherule ruptures, it releases hundreds to thousands of endospores, which can also replicate and travel throughout the body via the bloodstream. If you get an infection, you may or may not get sick. About two out of three people who get infected actually have no symptoms that are significant enough that make them want to see, seek medical attention. Uh, but one out of three people will develop an illness. And most of those develop uh, basically a community-acquired pneumonia. The kinds of symptoms you get with that kind of an illness is chest pain, cough, uh, often fever, night sweats, weight loss can be a very common symptom with, with uh, this, this form of pneumonia. Um, if you seek medical attention for this, a doctor won't be able to tell whether it is um, a, a pneumonia caused by this fungus or a pneumonia caused by a bacteria or a pneumonia caused by a virus. Uh, clinically, you can't tell the difference between valley fever as a cause of this pneumonia and anything else. So coxie is uh, a disease that is acquired environmentally from your environment, from the soil um, where the disease is endemic. Now coxie cannot be spread from person to person like, for example, influenza. So there can't be these contagious epidemics of coxie like there are with some other causes of pneumonia. So it seems likely that because this is acquired from your environment, that people who spend a lot of time outdoors are most likely to get infected. And in fact, that does seem to be the case. Um, people with occupations like uh, uh, construction workers or people who are uh, working in landscaping tend to be more likely to get the disease. But it's important to remember that it only takes one spore, so that in fact people can acquire the disease simply by walking down the street. Um, we've had cases of occur of people who've actually only been in, passing through the airport who've got infection. So it's really quite amazing that uh, it really only takes one spore to get infected and you can get infected in a multitude of areas. We think that in Mexico there's probably as much disease as there is in the desert areas of the southwest. But one of the issues in Mexico is that it's not clear that there, the capacity exists to diagnose the disease in Mexico. So although we think that it's highly prevalent in Mexico, we just don't have a lot of data about it. In June of 2004, I uh, went in because I had pain in my abdomen and I had um, ultrasound done where they found tumors, what they thought was tumors. And um, I ended up going up to Colorado to have surgery. At the time, they thought it was ovarian cancer. They were pretty certain that it was ovarian cancer. And so they did the surgery right away. It wasn't cancer. Uh, they didn't identify what it was. They only identified that it was benign. And so the tumors, or whatever they were, burst during the surgery. And they weren't able to, to capture any of them. And then they sewed me back up again, and three days later I, re I came home. I was released from the hospital. I came home, and uh, I was recovering. And then all of a sudden I had a rash, and I went into the doctor here in so southwest New Mexico, and, and um, uh, they put me on steroids and said that I was probably having an allergic reaction to shrimp. And I did those steroids for a few days. I continued to become more and more ill. I was coughing a lot, having trouble breathing, 
and ultimately um, the ambulance had to come and get me to take me into the hospital. I was really in bad shape. I had pneumonia in one lung. And um, they put me right away. Well, they did a lot of tests there. They did CAT scans. They did a test where they, you go in this little room and you breathe in radiation by yourself. They leave you alone. Plug your nose like this and you have to breathe in radiation for 45 minutes. I don't know what that test was, but it was scary. And just a series of tests. And what they ended up with was pneumonia and put me in the hospital. My um, lab work came back really strange. Everything was either high or low, or it was all over the place. February of 2008 is when you started having symptoms. Yeah, I started having leg pains, and my legs were hurting a little more, and... and uh, Chronic fatigue. I was getting tired a lot more in the afternoons. And one day we were, we were flagging our fence line, and I started feeling a lot of pain underneath my right uh, armpit and I figured that I had pulled a muscle, you know, because riding ATVs, you know, for a couple of days and that. So I came and I, we had a banquet dinner for my granddaughters for high school. So I bandied myself up and she, she came home that day. <laughs> I asked what he was doing and what had happened and he says, oh, I think I, I pulled a muscle. And, uh, I said, well, all right, and we went to the banquet and I noticed his color wasn't doing good and he was having like a little bit of shallow breathing. And um, that night we got home, I started looking up on the computer about pleurisy and I remember him having pleurisy before. And I asked him, do you think this is uh, pleurisy? And he says, you know, it, it does feel that way. And uh, I said, well, we need to make sure that we watched for fever and stuff like this. And sure enough, about 2 o'clock that morning is when uh, he woke up just with really bad chills and, and uh, fever. And I had already called the doctor that night, but we couldn't get in to see him until the next, uh, till Friday. And, uh, but we went ahead and, and went into the emergency room after that. And that's where they, they took a chest x-ray and then they came back and said that I had, uh, they had pneumonia. And uh, so they, they gave me antibiotics and everything. That I had a choice to stay, either stay there or come home. But if I, you know, the symptoms worsened, you know, to go back in. So we came home and I took the antibiotics and that, but I went back to work. No, 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 no. The no. next day, yeah, you did go back to yeah, work that next day. Yeah, I did go back day. to work. And, uh, but you had a doctor's appointment with uh, our primary. Yeah. And so he said, well, you know, they did diagnose you with the pneumonia, he said, and just to make sure because of your lung history, he says, let's uh, go ahead and, and give you a pretty strong dose of it. And at that point in time, he started taking it and um, started breaking out in a rash. We associated it with maybe he was having a, a reaction to the medicine. But now that we think back, uh, we think it was the valley fever that was actually coming out of him. I went to the doctor the 15th of November 2010 and uh, he took steroids to open my lungs, steroid shots and abit a butyrol uh, for the nebulizer and an antibiotic and I thought well okay maybe it's just bronchitis um, but I was having chills and fever and everything by the 15th of November. The uh, toward the end of the November I felt almost good enough uh, to think I was coming out of it and I got Mama transferred to Sierra Health Care, uh, another nursing home in Tier C, so we could just transport her to see Daddy, or, you know, two or three times a day. They were so used to seeing each other that it was very, very hard uh, for them to go days without seeing each other. 
Um, they've been married 75 years. So um, I got sick again. Uh, it, it was my birthday, I remember that, because um, my, a friend of mine got me an opera ticket. Opera ticket was on my bucket list. So um, I could not go. Um, I was very sick again. It was like harder than in November. The doctor gave me Cipro this time, heavier antibiotic, and the steroids and the nebulizer and the breathing treatments and had me t take nebulizer treatments at home and see if that would take care of it. Toward the end of the December, uh, I saw the lung specialist because on December 6th he also took an x-ray and he saw the little spot on my lung. It's about the size of a marble. And so he sent me to the lung specialist and that meant CAT scans. Um, he's seeing it. Uh, he's recommending a bronchoscopy. Um, so that's what we do. We do that in the 1st of January. Do, we do the bronchoscopy. Um, I am sick then again by January 13th, just 666. So there we are, back with the antibiotics and back with the steroids and this time an IV for dehydration, you know. He had felt like the bronchoscopy didn't really show. It was right between my lung and my breast, um, and so it was hard to get to in a bronchoscopy. So he suggested a needle biopsy. And I'm very, very glad that he did because it wasn't cancer. It was valley fever. In New Mexico, coccidia mycosis, or for short, coxy, is a reportable condition, which means it's uh, mandated by state regulation to be reported um, if there's a laboratory result or even the suspicion by a clinician or the general public that somebody has uh, this disease. However, what we've seen along the, the, the U.S.-Mexico border, particularly in uh, Arizona and, and California, are large increases over the past several decades in people diagnosed with coxie. In New Mexico, we know that we have between 20 and 60 cases total per year. Um, but in Arizona, in the last several years, there have been 10,000 or 12,000 cases each year. This has led us to the hypothesis that people aren't getting tested and diagnosed in New Mexico as much as we, we think uh, should occur. Last year in New Mexico, we worked with uh, uh, key stakeholders, in, uh, particularly in the southern part of the state, um, but around the state, in order to embark on uh, both an educational process with clinicians to educate them about COXI, as well as a survey for their knowledge, attitudes, and practice regarding uh, coccidia mycosis in New Mexico. And results from the survey showed that basically 70% of respondents uh, did not consider COXI in their differential diagnosis when they had a patient presenting with symptoms that are typical of COXI. Another interesting thing is, is that the respondents stated that very few of them, like about a third, stated that they had ordered tests for coxie. So what that tells us is that they're really not considering this in the patients that they're seeing that have symptoms consistent with the disease. Furthermore, 91% of the respondents said that to their knowledge they hadn't cared for a patient in the last year who had the disease coxie. From the survey results we saw that 50%, uh, over 50% of the um, respondents stated that they thought coxie was a problem in New Mexico. However, less than a third of those respondents said uh, that they knew how to diagnose and treat the disease. So what this survey really tells us is that uh, clinicians in this endemic area or an area of the world where coxie is found in the soil and uh, causes illness in people are really not considering it in the diagnosis of people with consistent symptoms um, and they're not testing for it. So this really leads us to believe uh, that in New Mexico this disease is underreported. What's happened over time is that uh, there's not univocality in the field about valley fever among doctors. And it is very costly when you're misdiagnosed and you are given a medication that makes it worse, so you have to go back again. Um, my experience last, like a month ago, 
was that I went in for pneumonia. I went to the emergency room. They diagnosed me as having pneumonia and pleurisy. And uh, so then I followed up, as they said, three days later with a general practitioner who um, said, I think you should be on antihistamines. I've had all these tests which say, yeah, we see tumors or yeah, we see uh, fibroids or yeah, we see lung cancer when it's not lung cancer. We see abdominal cancer when it's not abdominal cancer. All those tests cost lots and lots of money. We were just looking for answers because, you know, everybody, the, doc, <clears throat> the doctors we'd go through, you know, they, they ran up tests and tests and x-rays and but they couldn't they didn't have no idea what was going on so they would uh, we'd go to another doctor we'd go they'd send us to a, you know we're basically being pushed around from doctor to doctor to doctor nobody wanted to hear about belly fever I actually don't think that they knew that much about valley fever, especially in this area. And it was really frustrating to me because after living with this man for 40 years and, and knowing how strong of a person he is, and he was basically disappearing before my eyes. And I expressed this to the doctor that I'm losing my husband. I know my husband something is terribly wrong. At that point in time, I think they were kind of confused because they were running tests for TB, AIDS, um, every kind of disease I think that they could think of. And everything kept coming back negative. They kept saying, um, we're really confused. This thing is growing at a rapid rate and cancer usually doesn't grow that fast. Long doctor came in and that's when he told us that that's what they thought it was cancer, that we had to, you know, go in right away and... And I think at that point that was the lowest point of our life. Yeah, he said... And that was really hard to, to take in. Yeah, yeah, that because, you know, that's our first time facing, facing that disease and... And like he said, that he was just expanding too quick and by the time they needed to get in right away because it was already attached to the bronchial, the bronchial and the main artery, and that it was closing up my, closing the bronchial, the airway, the airway. So they did the surgery, and uh, he came out and he was actually really excited and said, "It's not cancer," and he said, "It's belly fever." But we had to go through all this to find out that it was. Valley Fever. So we think that, for example, in the state of Arizona, there are probably a hundred thousand infections every year. Um, of those hundred thousand, maybe only 30,000 actually seek medical attention. But we have from state um, statistics that only 10 to 12,000 patients every year are now being diagnosed with that. So it, it looks like probably two out of three patients seeking medical attention for an actual valley fever infection are misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. It's very important for us to know about this disease, uh, those of us that live in the Southwest, um, and it's, it's important for people to know about this as it is for doctors, because you can avoid uh, other therapies uh, that are of no use. For instance, if you treat this as a bacterial infection, um, when in fact you have a fungal infection, none of those antibiotics will do any good and often have side effects uh, which we'd like to avoid. Also, if you know that it's this problem and not something else, you don't have to have um, as many diagnostic tests. A lot of unnecessary medical uh, care can be avoided. In fact, one study showed that people who knew about this disease before they got sick got a diagnosis faster than those people who didn't know about the, uh, the disease before they got sick. It's as if those people asked their doctors, could I have valley fever? 
and um, it seemed to make a difference in the rapidity of getting the right test done to make a specific diagnosis. About 60 percent of people who um, contract the disease by inhaling the spores that are found in the soil um, will be basically asymptomatic. They won't have any any um, signs or symptoms and they won't feel ill. Forty percent, however, will feel ill with uh, you know, fever, fatigue, cough. The vast majority of that 40 percent will get better on their own. However, a certain subset, maybe one or two percent of those, or three to four of those patients, will have a recurrence at some point in time in the future. Out of the 40 percent, one to two percent of that will go on to uh, have disseminated disease which can lead to very severe illness, um, lots of medical care required, um, surgeries, uh, different procedures in order to um, try to get them to uh, achieve a cure. Uh, they might be on certain antifungal medications for long periods of time uh, and certainly it incurs a great cost to them both in their health uh, as well as uh, to the um, medical system in New Mexico. The financial stress that it has caused us uh, and the hospitalization was about eighty nine thousand dollars which thank god we we had insurance, insurance but we also had our part as far as co-payments and percentages and things like that that takes a real big financial burden on the family. Oh, you pay your co-pay at your doctor's or over to the specialist so that uh, they will go ahead and hopefully pay the rest. Um, it was just really hard. That was money straight out of my budget. If you take money that you designated for the propane for your heater house, or you take money designated for your car insurance, or for your tires, um, how do you make that money back up? So it's important to realize that anybody who lives in the endemic region can become infected with this fungal infection. For those people who do develop complications, they may have recurrent disease that spans years, even decades. Uh, they may require lifelong treatment to prevent those complications. It, and those patients become individual cases into themselves. Uh, if, for example, you have an infection that goes into one knee, how to manage that particular problem is, is um, going to be specific to how that patient needs to be managed. It's, it, so it becomes a very wide spectrum of manifestations depending on where the infection actually settles. Uh, but, but for that subgroup, those people who have complications, it's not uncommon for them to, to spend years if not their entire life having to kind of keep this under control. I've had pneumonia a few times. I've fatigued easily. Um, it's, there have been many um, things that I associate with valley fever. And one of the things is pain in my legs and pain in my ankles. Re that started with all this and just a lot of things, mostly lung things. If I'm exposed to something like a cold, then it gets really bad fast which happened recently. And uh, so it's just been a battle for all these years. With it, it feels like remissions where I'm highly energetic and I love life and I'm you know, gardening and I'm doing all these things and then I get hit with it and I'm down for a long time. There are a lot of hard days. There are a lot of days where I'm in pain, uh, tremendous pain in my legs. And so I'm lying down and putting uh, hot pads on my legs and things like that just so that the pain goes away. Um, I used to be a singer. I'm a musician and I can't sing because I don't have enough uh, I don't have enough strength to make the sound anymore. <coughs> and so that's pretty upsetting. Um, it was a huge part of my life. A bad day is when you feel like you're choking to death and because you're choking up so much phlegm and stuff, uh, you vomit, um, and then you get the shakes, and you're cold, and you're hot, and 
you know, the, the flu symptoms basically, but basically flu does not last five months. <laughs> so it would be, you know, so it was really rough. It was really rough. I, I, uh, those were days I could have had with my folks. Uh, my uh, dad died. He died in May, and so I had the last six weeks with him. And uh, that was great because I was feeling well enough that I could make him little treats and hang out at the vet home and do mom's hair and um, yeah and I have her now I'm very lucky they're, they're human things and I know that people go through I know that people go through a lot worse I know it could have been cancer that was scary the the, can, the big seek scare and I know that I, how lucky I am that I got over it on my own uh, it was just so unnecessary I have days where it is much easier to get out of bed than other days. And the depression is pretty monumental. It's pretty monumental because if it gets worse, you know, if it gets any worse than this, how can I even take care of myself? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if I can't hear, if I can't cook, you know. Um, it, it gets really scary. Actually, the one day that I came home and I had never, uh, had never seen my husband, I think, at his lowest point. And he said, this is the first time in my life, he said, that I actually thought about taking my life. He says, I don't wish this disease on anybody. Patients live with this disease. It doesn't go away. It, it does damage. I've always been a hard worker. I've always been able to do stuff by myself, my own. Uh, I've found out that there's a lot of, I can't do a lot of stuff. I find myself getting very tired and, and fatigued and I wake up with pain every day and I go through it. I've made, I've made a routine in the morning what I do you know, if there's anything to do around here or outside, I, you know, I'll go try and do it. And then I'll, if I get tired, I come in, I'll sit down, I'll read, read. And then I got my shop, you know, my little hobbies that, that I do. And I try to keep my mind busy this way. The pain, you know, I use a lot of, I still use, try to use uh, mind over matter. And some days it works, some days it doesn't. I find that if I'm exposed to germs, then I get sick, really sick fast. So I stay away from people. Um, I've given up on most extracurricular kinds of activities. I used to love to dance. I don't dance at all now. Um, and I never go out at night. I'm probably in, in bed every night by 8 o'clock. And I have to say no to a lot of things that I love. A lot of times I cry. Um, by the end about the pain because you know I want to go for a walk uh, I want to go horseback riding I want to do things and um, I just man that that really gets to me I took four different kinds of antibiotics uh, within three months and saw four doctors. I took the diagnosis from the needle biopsy and uh, showed it to my doctor. Yeah, on March uh, 3rd, the diagnosis came out that it was coxiediotomycosis. That was just the zebra among the horses, so it was really, you know, first you take care of the horses and then you look for the zebra later. Um, that may be true. But like a friend of mine says, you got to know what the zebra looks like. So what are we doing in New Mexico about coxie? Well, we're taking the problem very seriously, and we want uh, the underdiagnosis and the underreporting to be corrected. And so we're embarking with uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as uh, 
experts in Arizona who see thousands of cases and are affiliated with the Valley Fever Center for Excellence in Tucson to provide educational materials to clinicians in the state of New Mexico. We've had um, uh, sponsored some continuing medical education credits so that uh, clinicians can receive credit for learning about this disease. And we've also um, provided conferences where clinicians can gather um, and meet and hear speakers that are experts on the disease and learn how to diagnose and treat their patients appropriately. We're also attempting to uh, educate the general public. Lots of people have never even heard of this disease, uh, let alone know when they have symptoms that are consistent with other you know, viral illnesses or other common colds uh, that when they see their physicians they should talk about um, is this possibly coxie and what does that mean to me. So what we want is clinicians to um, do the simple blood test early, diagnose the patient, start appropriate therapy uh, as indicated uh, so that we can prevent those misdiagnoses, delay in diagnosis and long-term complications. The New Mexico Department of Health is working with the public health authorities in Arizona and in the Mexican states of Sonora and Chihuahua um, in order to develop capacity regarding uh, COXI in this region. And what I mean by capacity is that we're developing educational materials for the general public, for clinicians, and, and for patients, as well as uh, trying to enhance uh, the availability of clinical diagnostic testing in order to um, provide for clinicians the ability to test for COXI. Well, physicians anywhere should know that valley fever is a very important disease within its endemic regions. So even physicians uh, well away from the endemic region, if they have a patient who has recently traveled to an endemic area for valley fever, should put it on the radar. Uh, inside the endemic regions, it's very common, and I think doctors who are, any doctor seeing patients uh, with new illnesses should, should be familiar with this. At the Valley Fever Center for Excellence at the University of Arizona, we're trying to help with that. On our website uh, are um, both uh, medical education programs and also other information to help clinicians as well as the general public understand this disease more. People who are at higher risk for developing severe disease, and, and these people include people who are, have weakened immune system, for example, if they're receiving uh, steroid treatment or they've had an organ transplant, or persons who have uh, HIV infection, or also people who are African American or even of um, Filipino descent, and also women in their third trimester of pregnancy. These are the groups that are at high risk for getting very severe disease from COXI. The biology of this disease shows that so often the human immune system is able to control the infection. It's so tempting for us to want to have a way through vaccination to prevent this disease entirely. It's an exciting idea. Um, people are working on that, but the reality of vaccine development is that it takes a long time and, and a lot of uh, financial support. Being tested for the disease is quite easy, actually. Um, often people will have a blood test, a simple blood test, to check for antibodies to, uh, to the coxie infection and this can be quite helpful in many cases. Uh, we think that risk every year in Arizona, for example, is 3% per year. And it may be simply the fact that you're living here is the risk. Now, it's a manageable risk. I don't think that, um, that it is necessarily something that should scare people from, uh, from living in this beautiful part of the world but it's better to know that it exists and manage that risk uh, than to pretend it doesn't exist at all. You can get back the money maybe and you maybe even get back your health but that time you know time is what is where our memories are they hold our memories and uh, that time was lost. One of the worst aspects of the disease is the emptiness that you feel and the loneliness because um, the person that you used to be is no longer there. This week I emailed my friend Annie that also has uh, this disease and uh, I said I miss my husband. 
I miss what we used to have, even though he's here in body and in mind and in soul. I do miss what we had this disease is taking.